Thank you for listening to Mormon Sex Info. This episode is an archived episode and is only now becoming publicly available. Mormon Sex Info relies on contributions. To contribute, please visit mormonsex.info. And now, please enjoy this episode. Welcome to another co-production between Mormon Sex Info and Mormon Mental Health Podcast. This is our supposed monthly book club-ish type of format for all things sex between me and other certified, asex certified sex therapists, and where we just kind of come together and talk about different things that are in the news and especially in the Mormon news. So tonight I am joined by previous guest, Shannon Hickman. I'm always so glad to have her on board. She is the owner of Core Healing Counseling in the North Salt Lake City area, I believe. You can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Mm -hmm. Murray. I'm in Murray. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm super excited to have her on. We have several things that we're going to try to address tonight. Before I do that, just a quick reminder for those who are interested in the Mormon Matters Retreat that is coming up in October. Believe it or not, that's coming up sooner than we realize. It's October 12th through 14th, starting to fill up. So make sure you reserve your spots. We can only have so many people come because of the venue. So uh, if you're interested in needing help through a faith transition in any way, shape, or form, or wanting to stay involved with Mormonism in a nuanced way. These are great retreats for that. There's more information on mormonmatters.org about that. You can also PM me or send me a message and I can give you more information. Also, I'm still, of course, asking for donations for Mormon Mental Health Podcast. So anybody who finds value in that, please help by throwing a few dollars its way so we can keep it going past 2018, which is one of my big goals this year is to try to make sure it's a sustainable podcast financially. So thank you for all who are helping with that. And for those of you who are coming at this through the Mormon Sex Info subscription, thanks so much for that as well. We really enjoy having you on board. So Shannon, how the heck are you doing? Good, really good. <laughs> we missed last month. We I think we were all so busy that yes. there was no sex book club last month. <laughs> I know. I can't believe summer's coming to an end. I know. I miss you all when I don't get to talk to you. So. <laughs> but anyway, we thought we would hit several different little articles that came out. So the first one that we're going to talk about, if I can find it here, is an article that came out in the Meridian magazine, which I've got to say, there's a lot of articles on there that I have struggled with in the past. There are a few good ones, but I'm usually writing them letters of complaints, unfortunately, especially when it comes to issues around sexuality. And there it was an article that was published in uh, end of July, July 30th, that is called Why Comprehensive Sexuality Education Does More Harm Than Good. Uh, It is written by a bachelor's degree graduate from Brigham Young University, Idaho. And she Mm -hmm. graduated from the Marriage and Family Studies program. So right away, there's, you know, I think we've been talking a little bit about this, Shannon, but I want to just start off by saying I am becoming more and more concerned (laughs) with how little checks and balances I think there are in certain programs and not just Mormon ones, not just BYU programs Mm -mm. in regards to really encouraging people who are going into mental health professional fields to challenge their own religious bias. Yes. Yes. I totally agree. And I was telling you before we got on that um, that was something that both of my programs, I was fortunate enough to have. Um, I got my undergrad at the University of Utah in social work and my master's degree at Rutgers University. And so I was fortunate to have that. But I think there's a lot of programs out there that aren't um, helping people to kind of understand their biases and then yeah, you have to kind of check it at the door if you're going to work with people, um, you know, because you're going to have people from all different walks of life come in and you can't impose your beliefs on somebody. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, when I'm trying to think back, I mean, my training was a long time ago and I do think I got really good training, but I'm not sure that this is ever really a subject that came up much really at all. And I really had to kind of grapple with my own religious bias throughout my own career, you know, that I feel like I did that more on my own, you know, over time. So I don't think it was something that was really very much addressed. In fact, I think that there were times when if I remember even in our human sexuality class, which we only had one class on and it was one semester. So not two semesters, you know, they would show videos and things and they would always say, if you're uncomfortable, you can opt out. You know, they almost made it too easy for us to just say, yeah, I've got, I've got my own beliefs or my own things. And so therefore I opt out of educating myself on these things that are sexual of nature. So At the time, I didn't think twice about that, but now I'm thinking that should have been addressed differently. Like if you have an issue with becoming educated around issues of sexuality, you know, you probably need to like think about, is this really the direction I should be going? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. Well, and I think you and I come from probably a little bit of a different place too, because um, just to have our uh, sex therapy certification through ASECT, we had to go through the 10 hour uh, training of the SAR, which is the sexual attitude um, reassessment, right? Am I saying that right? Yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, you're exposed to everything and anything so that you can help people uh, when they walk in your door and put aside all of your judgments and help them in the place where they're at. Um, because I think that's something that we constantly have to do, especially in private practice and as therapists, uh, constantly have to um, be aware of our countertransference and what's coming up for us. Yeah. With clients. Yeah, that was that was so not that we do we a good job. Opt out of that. Mm-mm. That was not an Mm-mm. option if you Mm-mm. want that certification. <laughs> no, definitely not. It was required, and I think it would benefit uh, some of these programs to have something like that required, like five hours of something like that, or, you know, at least a course, three hour credit course. Right. I think that would be really good, but I think there's so, I mean, this is part of probably what we're going to get into, but I think that just in general, and maybe I shouldn't speak so broadly because I don't know of all the programs out there, But I know when I went, there were not hardly any options that I can recall for taking a class on sexuality within like therapy and social work. Mm, Yeah. Yeah. I think some programs are getting much better at that and others are still way behind. And I think this is why I, I feel like, you know, as the audience listens to us, the reason I even start with this particular topic is because even with like some of the stuff that we've, you know, with the whole Sam Young advocacy effort, you know, around one-on-one interviews and stuff, which we'll talk a little bit about later as well. But it's been interesting for me to see comments and comment threads and LDS therapists speaking up against the action in ways and, and saying, you know, not just speaking up from a personal perspective, but saying, you know, I'm a certified, you know, social worker, right. Or I'm a licensed therapist. And, and this is why I disagree with this. And their language is very religious. And I'm just shocked at how comfortable they are showing how (laughs) religiously biased they are just on on a public forum like that. And I'm guessing not even realizing their own religious bias. And so the reason why this is so concerning to me is because I feel like it's already so difficult to wade through all the misinformation out there about sexuality. And on top of it, you have people with credentials or with backgrounds where you feel like, oh, I should be able to trust somebody who just graduated from a marriage and family studies program, right? I should be able to trust somebody who obviously has a background in in dealing with family issues. And yet this whole article is so problematic, you know, from the perspective of of us who are trained in sexuality in particular. So I I just can't imagine how does the public know (laughs) 
<laughs> what to believe. <laughs> if, well, if, and I think you're making a good point. And, and, you know, uh, you're more familiar with this magazine than I am, but, um, but I mean, this doesn't say opinion anywhere, right? Like I, part of me is like wondering where uh, she is getting her facts from. And uh, that's concerning to me. Yes. Um, that we would just publish something like this without having um, maybe accurate, like you said, knowledge and information. Yes. Because I think people would read this and think, oh, yeah, this is good advice. Um, you know, it is someone that just graduated. I totally agree with what you're saying. Well, and then and I, I don't in any way want her to feel like, you know, that we're coming down hard on her or, um, you know, that, uh, I don't want to have her feel shame, but, uh, I think we have to be really, really careful, uh, with what we post, um, when we maybe don't have the, uh, training to be posting things like this, the accurate training. Yeah. Well, and I'm guessing she may not even know she doesn't have the training, right? This is what I mean by Yeah. And I, I don't know. I don't know what they teach you in marriage and family studies, but I'm sure people that hear that probably think, oh, marriage and family studies, <laughs> like sex falls under that, right? Talking to your kids about sex falls under that. Right. All right. Well, let's dive into what we find problematic about it. So first of all, she starts off with a, an example about how there was a creek by her house and that, you know, when she was a little kid, her parents talked about how they didn't want her to go by that creek because of the dangers around it. And so, you know, it was, it was very much, they, they just talked to her about the dangers of it. And of course, then later when she had a friend who invited her to go down to the creek, she figured, well, I can't talk to my parents about that because of course they're going to say no. They already told me it was dangerous. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go down there by myself. And, and sure enough, she had, you know, she didn't get swept away to her death, but she had a somewhat negative experience and, you know, she did take a risk and it was a dangerous risk. And then she got in trouble later for it. So that's kind of how she starts this little article with this idea that parents shouldn't even be talking about something dangerous because then you're enticed to go down that road. Right. And it's it very yeah. their curiosity. It sparked her curiosity. So she decided to go down. And this is an age old, you know, I guess myth, right? That people yes. are, are, you know, if you talk about sex, if you educate about sex, then kids will go do the things that you're telling them not to do. And I think the part that she's missing there, <laughs> and granted, I did not specialize in, uh, you know, child development other than what was required to get my degree. Um, by no means am I an expert on this, but uh, that's just part of being a child, right? They're curious. Um, curiosity is just a piece of it and exploring exploring the world, exploring um, what's around them, exploring nature, which is sort of what she was doing, right? Well, what I find actually kind of hilarious about her framing about this is that she actually makes our point that most sex education is abstinence-based. And mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. Do it. Don't and that do it. is exactly what happened. In trouble. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so, so I'm just saying abstinence based creek information did not work for her either. No. No. <laughs> and then she and... went on to uh, critique pleasure education. I'm like, well, maybe if they would have talked about how to have, you know, pleasure at the creek and how they would help her do that in correct ways. <laughs> Maybe she would have. <laughs> right. Or you need an adult with you or wear a life jacket. <laughs> Safety, how to get out, right? Something happens. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I totally agree. She makes the exact point that uh, we're constantly talking about that um, it, it's so often that conversation between parents is uh, just enough to peak uh, the curiosity or they have absolutely no clue what the parents are even talking about. Right. 
with right. sex. They're like, don't have it till you're married. Don't have sex. Well, I don't even know what sex is. <laughs> I don't even know what you're talking about. Right. And that's so often. And it, we always go back to it's the one talk, right? Not many. It was that one talk where most kids by that time, they've waited too long um, and they either have all the information or they're doing it too early. Um, I think the piece she's missing in here is that, and, and this is where I'm wondering where she got her facts from. Um, she's missing that all of these, this like comprehensive sex education and all of the education that you and I and all the other therapists talk about um, is age appropriate right? There's age appropriate education. We're not going to sit a four-year-old down and talk about pleasure and orgasms and condoms and, you know, lube. We're going to give a four-year-old age appropriate uh, information to just start the framework for developing healthy sexuality. Yeah. She also, it's really interesting how she demonizes some really great organizations that you know are very well known for good sexual education so that's always interesting too to kind of see some of the biases there really fast Kristen Hodson did you just come on I'm on hi Hello. yay hi well, thanks for being patient it's Shannon hi hi, hi. Asha. it's like so. a huge party hi everyone <laughs> hi <laughs> And we're glad you're on. <laughs> yes, we're just starting this conversation about this article in Meridian Magazine against comprehensive sexual education. And I'm so glad you're on, yeah. Kristen, because, and, and I'll introduce you here in a minute, but you were very involved, I think, just in this last year or two with a lot of legislation in Utah around sexual education. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. I was really involved when you had... Um, Representative King pushing through a comprehensive sex ed bill, um, and it was fascinating to watch and gave me huge insights onto the pro on the process and really how far we have to go. Right. Okay. So the point that I was making, and by the way, people, Kristen Hodson is another ASEC certified therapist. She runs the Healing Group in the Salt Lake City area, and we'll link her information. And she's great. She's been on before. So welcome to the show, Kristen. Thank you. So yeah, so she calls out agencies like the World Health Organization and UNICEF and, you know, just, just real, and even Planned Parenthood, which I know Planned Parenthood comes with a lot of, you know, different feelings and ideas about it. But these are all organizations that very much have comprehensive sexual education resources and ideas. And I am constantly referring people to their websites and just wonderful ways of knowing how to talk to your kids. And, and then she talks about this, where was it? Which I've never even heard of before. Um, oh, SRA. SRA. Risk Avoidance Programs. Wait, what is it? Sexual Risk Avoidance Programs, SRA. Oh, I've not heard of that. And she, yeah, she quotes some... We had to look it up. We hadn't, didn't know what it was either, <laughs> which is already kind of a which, yeah, which is very. I mean, so she's claiming that, you know, this type of education reduces teen sexual activity by approximately 50%, which I highly doubt. And then on top of it, you know, as we went to go look at it, it was an abstinence-based program, which actually there's a lot of research to show that abstinence-based programs are actually very risky when it comes to increased rates of pregnancy, increased rates of penis and vagina sex, increased rates and in just risky behavior because kids aren't educated and don't know how to deal with situations when they maybe come across those situations when they didn't plan for them. So there's just so many problems with this. But Well, and I kind of touched on it earlier, Natasha, but it says uh, right here, sending the wrong message and maybe you already touched on this, but she says, likewise, comprehensive sexuality, sexuality education is killing our children's innocence and initiating a dangerous curiosity in children who are not ready for such information. So that is going back to what I was just talking about. Um, we're not advocating that you give kids, uh, you know, information that's not appropriate for their age. Right. Kristen, have you had a chance to look this article over? 
I'm, I'm running downstairs. I was pulling out um, the national sex ed standards and what is seen as developmentally appropriate, like across the grades, because there's always this idea that comprehensive sex education, and I don't know how this gets thrown in there, but there's this idea that we're going to teach our kids how to give oral sex in second grade. Right, right. Um, so, and these are, there's not, there's not going to be these teachers that, that are, that are going to be implementing that kind of thing, and nor is that age appropriate. So um, I'm, I'm pulling those up. I'm going to go pull up this article, but there were so many problems. I do believe she mentions CECAS, which is where the national sex ed standards and does she mention that in the article? Yeah, I think she does. Yep. CECAS. And that's okay. the one she's talking about that's linked to, has, it says, uh, pioneered comprehensive sexuality education uh, CSE in the U.S. and has close ties to Planned Parenthood from its inception. Okay. Um, and I right now. just earlier pulled up the, and Natasha and I were talking about it before we got on, but the um, Our Whole Life um, yes. for uh, I think that's a great one too for education and how to educate, educate your kids. And just K through uh, first grade they're saying like this is the topics they cover our wonderful bodies healthy bodies safe bodies families families and feelings babies and families birth of a baby celebrations that's their entire curriculum until first grade mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well it's building blocks like it sexual health education is building blocks much like we are helping kids develop reading literacy, math literacy, and we're starting with the basics, like identify the letters, and then you're going to start putting those letters to form different kinds of sounds, and then you're going to form basic words, and they get all of this education over a lifespan, and it builds on each other. You're not introducing a kid in second grade to calculus or mm -hmm. even algebra. There's this belief that sexual health education is going to be that instead of the building blocks and the foundation of healthy sexuality is friendship. It's boundaries. It's, um, oh, I'm, I'm blanking, but it's, it's these basic fundamental principles that make up healthy relationships where they have everything to do with sexuality and nothing to do with sexuality at all. So that as they grow, they've got these foundational ideas of healthy relationships and then you can add to it and add to it just as their their capacity and their brains develop you can give them more information and more context and more nuance and and so it's a, a huge flawed idea that we're going to be introducing these complex ideas around sexual behavior and, and even the idea that we're going to start with behavior instead of just relationships self-esteem body image hygiene all of these things that's right. where most of this is starting. Well, and I think um, also uh, just to go along with that, it helps parents to just know, like when my child's behaving in this way, because I think sometimes parents feel like their child's, uh, you know, playing with their uh, genitals or, you know, at a very young age that it's somehow sexual versus right. it just feels good like sucking their thumb mm -hmm. and so a lot of this right also here. helps educate parents well bodies can feel good when touched of course my kids want me to tickle their arms when they go to bed every night every mm -hmm. box. You, you can talk about appropriate touch there's so many things that are taken out of context yeah. um, and well, this whole feeling of sexual pleasure being something bad, like she quotes, you know, the IPPF is all about, quote, ensuring that all young people understand that they are entitled to sexual pleasure and how to experience different forms of sexual pleasure is important for their health and well-being. L like somehow pleasure is equating it with a negative. And then she goes on to say, teaching children how to experience different forms of sexual pleasure goes beyond learning about human development, intimacy, and reproduction. And I'm like, holy cow, like, would we want to teach about reproduction without talking about pleasure? Do we want to talk about intimacy without talking about pleasure? And 
why is pleasure like it it feels like we're over sexualizing the word word pleasure just by being so against it like like you just said like mm-hmm. you know, touching your arm is pleasurable touch you know having a back rub having somebody stroke your hair all of that feels good that's pleasurable but somehow this pleasure word eating is chocolate plated <laughs> with something like they're almost over sexualizing it just by making such a big deal about it well and let, I think, let me oh. throw in oh go ahead Shan. no you're fine i was just gonna say i think that's part of the problem that we have in our country and you guys we all see this in our offices all the time um that because this is a miss people don't know how to have pleasure in sex and if you are in europe there might be a soap commercial on that has a naked woman on the television and that's just this the norm it's just a body but mm-hmm. because we have this idea that we can't talk about it we can't look at it we have to be secretive about it we have to stay pure that all of a sudden we turned it into something that it doesn't need to be mm-hmm. yeah Sorry, go ahead. I, I was just gonna say that it's it's a fascinating i think up against do you remember natasha the the church's video um on pornography and it had the kids narrating about pornography do you remember that video yes i do it's actually a great video and it's the the kids the word that stood out is they used the word pleasure they acknowledge that our bodies experience a variety of sensations that are pleasurable and our bodies are designed to experience pleasure and I think that's huge because um, there is an acknowledgement that pleasure matters and, and that is how our bodies are designed. Yeah, I'm going to have to find a link to that now and, and make sure I post it on this podcast resources. So it was, it was a fair, I had very little to critique about that. Which I was happily happy about. Yeah. 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 It was a good, it was a good video. And again, I'll just underscore it. The fact that they have kids say the word pleasure was bigger I think than it got credit it kind of flew under the radar that whole video but it's a good one I agree well she says don't subject your children to CSE which by the way that's comprehensive sexual education (laughs) with its bad track record I'm not really sure what she's talking about there insist on the use of effective programs that include parents in the process of sexual education and I again she talks about abstinence-based programs, which we actually have tons of research showing its ineffectiveness. She talks about China having... Yeah, I was like, wow, that's an odd correlation. Oh, but sure. <laughs> China has a you lot. You can't go to the Netherlands because then it debunks everything. Yeah, or right. uh, Canada <laughs> or Sorry. Europe. Um, yeah, I lived in China. It, I mean, that's a whole nother uh, dynamic over there that's going on. Yeah. And I, that's not a, a good correlation at all to emulate, you know, as far as some of the issues that they're having with sexual shame or sexual, there's actually all kinds of sexual values in the Orient that I think would make a lot of LDS people very uncomfortable <laughs> as far as looking mm-hmm. at sexuality from a totally different <laughs> concept that has very little to do with our value system. So I, I'm just kind of shocked that she brings up China as an example, when actually there's quite a bit of research to show that yes, many countries in Europe, Canada have us beat by a long shot on all the lower STDs, yeah. lower rates of teen pregnancy, lower rates they of all abortion. have education. Yep. Did you want to talk, comment a little bit, Kristen? You had kind of mentioned things that you found very interesting as you supported this comprehensive sexual education legislation that was trying to get through in Utah. Yeah. Do you want me to? Do you want to? I, I don't want to hijack it. No. So if you want to segue to no, that, we can. Hijack it. No. I think one thing you could talk about, maybe Kristen, because I think there's a fear, and she talks a little bit about this, but I think there's a fear from parents that they're going to have no control over it um, right? and what their child learns. And I think you should, and I'm sure you're going to talk about that. Okay. But. Well, so that, that, that's a good, that, I'm glad you brought that up because that is a fear. It's a legitimate fear. And I want to talk a little bit about the process because 
to speak, if, if parents want something different for their kids, they are going to have to get involved in the process because what I witnessed in terms of people that did not want this bill, which is largely the Eagle Forum organized by a woman named Gail Rizika. She has more power around sexuality in Utah than anybody. I mean, there, I, I won't go into this, but the, the bill that just got passed this last legislative session about that was going to be teaching consent skills got rapidly changed over to refusal skills. And wow. it's an awful bill, but that was a Gail Rizika thing because there's heavy political involvement from the other side. But but what happened, and Natasha, feel free to edit or tell me if this is just too long. Um, no, but I'm, what happened is no. if you... Okay, so when you sponsor a bill, you get to do a presentation. If you don't get to, if you don't sponsor the bill, you get to testify. And the parameters in which you get to testify are set up by the committee. Um, and, and again, if I have any errors, please feel free to correct me, people that are listening. But this is, I'm just going to reflect my process of what I saw. Um, so there was a bill that, because a Democrat was sponsoring the comprehensive sex ed, the, he had the opportunity to do a presentation and the other side, the Republicans, uh, would have had a chance just to testify. So what happened was another bill got put up where in, in Utah, currently they talk about, they can teach about sexual abuse, I believe in the second grade. And this is an opt out program, meaning everyone's going to go in unless you opt out instead of it being opt in, which I'll talk about. So they were trying to say, so that got passed. That was done uh, by Angela, Representative Angela Romero. Romero. And it, it, it's a wonderful bill. It protects kids. And what ends up happening is they put up a bill trying to change that from opt out to opt in meaning we're going to teach about sexual abuse and now you have to opt in and it was kind of a ridiculous bill but they then did a presentation that consisted of a therapist a homeschool parent another oh an educator and somebody else and it was a very very thorough presentation not on their bill but on comprehensive sex ed. So they get through this really detailed, thorough, compelling, persuasive presentation, not on their bill at all, but all the committee then heard the bill or heard the presentation. And one of the committee members at the end said, what did this have to do with your bill? And more or less, or more or less, it was like nothing, but we wouldn't have had a chance to present. So it was strategy, right? Because now all of the committee members can't unhear what they just heard. So I was like, whoa, that was fascinating and incredibly smart. So then it, that gets voted down. It's, that law is going to stay the same for Utah. And then it's Representative King doing the presentation for comprehensive sex ed. And what this was going to be wasn't just an introduction of we're going to do comprehensive sex ed. That's just as vague as using a word like intimacy or pornography and not breaking it down, deconstructing it and asking what exactly you mean. Comprehensive sex ed right now, you need to say, well, what do you mean? What does that look like? So the state of Utah, this first bill that was, he was introducing was just going to make it so that they could start looking at a potential curriculum that could be good for Utah schools and families. That was just going to be it. And they were going to start evaluating a curriculum and having district meetings and parent meetings and starting. That was like layer number one. So they weren't just going to all of a sudden adopt comprehensive sex ed. It was going to be adopting the opportunity to start evaluating a potential curriculum. And then let's say they identify a curriculum then there would be another layer where districts can look and see if that's a curriculum they want to introduce. Districts could opt in. Um, and, it, and it just kept going down to even then if a district adopted um, a comprehensive sex ed curriculum. 
then what was going to further happen is then parents, it was still going to be opt in, not opt out. So you would have to opt your child into the program. And then the, the other proposal was put to put the curriculum online so that parents could get the exact same information that they were teaching in school and bridge the communication between parents, teachers, school, and expand the conversations. And it, it, that's what it was going to be. And it got killed rapidly because when it came time, Rep Representative King opted to not do any sort of formal presentation, nothing. He just had a bunch of professionals and passionate people. And he had a good chain of professionals testify, but there were so many people on both sides that the committee said each person has one minute and they timed it. And when your minute was done, you were done. Wow. So you had to figure out. So I was, I was the first one to go and I had to articulate my message in one minute. That is hard. And then what happened after Rep King's side went, then the other, the other side had a chance to respond. And they lined up, and what Gail Rizika did is she had a team, and they went line by line, and they had each person testify based on the line that was in the bill. So they would say, line 167, and then they would make another comment, and then the person behind it would be like, line 22. Oh, and wow. they were so organized and thorough, and they spoke so smartly about this bill that it, it I mean, it got voted down quickly. But an, another fascinating part of this process is Turner Britton, who was the executive director of the Utah Coalition Against Sexual Assault at the time, he also was there testifying. And I mean, he's heavily, he was heavily, heavily involved in a major influencer around sexual assault and safety and consent. And he testified and he talked about how people who have been assaulted um, they don't know the name of their anatomy, and he used the word vagina. And one of the committee members hit their buzzer and then asked the committee chair, he's like, can we please get this room under control? Look at the language you're starting to use. This is getting out of hand because he used the proper terminology for genitalia. Wow. And so all of this went down, and it, it just got shot down lightning quick. Um, unfortunately, Rep King had no idea what CECUS was, so he couldn't speak competently to what that was. He couldn't speak to the National Sex Ed Standards, um, to any of it. And so that's, that's really the way it went down. Um, and then this last, this last legislative session is where they were going to introduce consent and it went to refusal skills and now that that's law it's like ugh, and, and that's a whole other show to be honest with you yeah for um, but sure. that's what it looks like currently and unless there is a far better organization around how to move this forward it, it won't move forward yikes it's really sad it was really discouraging and sad and eye-opening Mm -hmm. well, it kind of goes back to what we talked about at the very beginning when you weren't here, Kristen, but just the how difficult it is when you have supposedly so many experts, right? Or so many people who know, and yet there's such vast differences in backgrounds and credentials and and just the amount of religious bias that there is. And And I think that also just how's the public supposed to know the difference between all of us? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep, and, and that was very, that was very clear um, about the bias and, and the other, I mean, they had pediatricians, they had, they had so many people with a variety of professional backgrounds could, that could speak competently to this issue. Wow. Um, but there, there was a, an interesting perspective that I also want to put on the table regarding this is there's already low funding for teachers and the public education system and so where does the funding come where do, te do teachers get paid more or do they just get more to their plate and they've got to teach something additional and I thought that was a fair argument that would be worthwhile to look at and discuss and I think the, the biggest shame in all of this 
is that there just wasn't an opportunity to further the dialogue and explore different curriculums. And maybe you don't adopt all of it, but you adopt some of it and see how that goes and start to build public trust and public rapport and, and you know, introduce it slowly and just start slowly introducing these things. And instead of, I think Rep King's bill, it, it, it's kind of, unfortunately, this pendulum, like it's abstinence only or the entire everything. Mm-hmm. Right? Why not just start with some of these pieces that are pushing Utah's growth edge, but not so far that they just shut it down. And so I think that's, that's the saddest part and that they were going to include the parents and the families. Um, and they wanted that, which I really liked personally. I thought that was a great part of it. Um, but this, but this idea that comprehensive sex ed is out to sexualize children, that it's out to introduce them and teach them how to engage in all these sexual behaviors at a really young age is it just couldn't be further from the truth. Like you look at Al Vernacchio, who's an incredible sex educator Mm -hmm. in the Midwest and author of For Goodness Sex. He teaches comprehensive sex ed in a private religious school. And where does he start off with all of his sexual health education values? Yeah, And it's not yeah. him imposing the values, it's no. helping the kids be able to identify with their values and learn what they are so that they can honor them and make informed, wise decisions based on their values. So it's being done, and it's being done really well. well. And they're, yeah. Right. So there's, there's, really good, there's really good people doing good things with good results, and um, America... I, uh, the other change is the Netherlands really focus a lot on relationships and we really do right now focus on sexual behavior. Oftentimes it's the relationships that come before the behavior. Like how do we navigate love? How do we navigate consent? How do we navigate all these things? And that's where it could begin. That's where the opportunity is. Well, and we all know from sitting where we sit that this stuff, they're exposed to it through movies, mm-hmm. through magazines through all kinds of media and so then they don't know what to do with that information that they're exposed to yeah um so the education when it's not happening the you know where they're getting it is very unhealthy oftentimes Mm -hmm. especially because it's adult material that they're viewing a lot of times right and i i won't I won't call out an organization in this, but there's a very prominent organization in Utah that goes around and does assemblies and they are teaching about pornography from an addiction standpoint. Um, And this last legislative session also gave them um, the opportunity if a district approves for them to come into their school and do an assembly, and this can be junior high kids, uh, they don't. They don't have to get parent consent um, to talk about pornography, and they are overlaying values about that as well. And pornography is very much has very much to do with sex and sexuality. And so that was another thing that slipped through. Um, and so now Utah schools, if parents aren't aware, their their child could attend an assembly without them knowing, because they don't have to get parental consent. Are you talking about fight the new drug? <laughs> I, I, mean, I can confirm i can neither confirm or deny Natasha. Why, why can i just ask why and we can cut this part out if you don't want me to have this part on but i'm just like why can't it's just a know? piece of my it, we can it's just the it's just the professionalism in which i i don't want to publicly call out organizations uh, it's it, I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying that on in terms of, I feel like the conversation can still be had. People can ask the questions and get the information. Um, Without naming them. Well, right. Yes, it's, and at the same time, I guess it's just, it's public information that they're able to do this. So there's nothing. Like that's true. That's true. About this. And that's true. That's the only organization yeah, it, I'm aware of that can do that oh, no they're so Utah yeah that's that's the only one that can 
get away with that. But that's also because Todd Weiler has said pornography has nothing to do with sex ed. And he said that time and time again of these are two separate issues. Pornography and sex ed have nothing to do with each other. And so you How have like, new that, job that goes possible. <laughs> uh, right. Oh my but, God. Um, so you well, really is, have. So a long time ago, for well, it feels like a long time ago, several years ago, for those who don't know in the audience, several of us wrote an op-ed in the Salt Lake Tribune about this issue. And mm-hmm. Nicole Prousey, who's a neuroscientist, went a step further and actually like wrote a lot of the school boards in Utah about this issue. And that's what the school board came back with was this pushback that, well, we can offer these programs that don't go through the, you know, the rigorous kind of pushback of what's going to be included in sexual education because pornography is not about sex ed. So yeah. how in how in the world are we saying on the one hand, we're so freaked out about pornography, but then on the other hand, not tying that with sexuality is just so weird. And that's just such a weird loophole to me that I just, I don't even understand it. So I, yeah. I don't understand. And, and it's completely hypocritical of we don't want our kids to have values taught. We want to do it in the home. Yet when something's being taught that aligns with our values, we're just fine with it because they're furthering our values. Um, because it is very much a value-based conversation uh, and assembly and presentation. And when I've had parents ask me to get more education of, why is this a bad thing? Like, we can all agree that pornography is bad, right? And so you have to break that down and, and educate on why this is so problematic to have this in Utah schools without parental consent. Because at first glance, it seems like, yeah, what is the big deal? Why are you why are you all against something that's really just helping our kids? Right. Okay. Are we ready to move on from this topic? Because I don't know what else to say about it. Then I'm just <laughs> cautious. Yeah. We have two other topics I'd like to barely briefly talk about. One of them I'm just gonna jump into. And again, feel free at any point to both of you just tell me to stop. But I feel like part of educating the public is to talk about different voices, different people who are public, just like I know plenty of people talk about me in Mm -hmm. very negative ways because they have a right to critique what I've written publicly. So I would like to talk about a colleague of ours who is Laura Brotherson. She is the author of, and they they were not ashamed. And they were not ashamed, which actually I have, recommended on several. Yeah, I have too. I think it's a great book. I think she did a great piece of work on that. However, I'm subscribed to her newsletter and I get a lot of different things coming from her. And the reason why I want to talk about this again, goes back to some of this training piece is that I'm surprised by some of the things that come from her that are very either, well, there's definitely been issues in regards to supporting transgender issues. And there's definitely been issues Mm -hmm. in I think the way she talks about gender in in general. So just recently there was, uh, she didn't write it, but she posted to, again, fight the new drug. She posts, uh, she does a lot of links to them. And she also did a, she linked to a article written by somebody that's uh, husbands, your wife isn't a porn star, which not sure we, we need to get into it, but basically just, pits men and women against each other in ways that I'm just really disappointed in. And and so much of the work that we are trying to do, I think, as certified sex therapists. So, but you go onto her website and she is a certified sex therapist. No, she's not. Well, let me just, let me just talk about that (laughs) because she has the same same credentials, right? That you would see after my name. Letter. Just C-S-T. Letter. C-S-T. So you go, and it takes me a while to figure out how to figure out where, where she's got her training, but I finally figured it out on her website and it takes me to the American board of Christian sex therapists and it's the Institute for sexual wholeness. And so she gets to write CST after her name because she got her sex 
her certified, it's not even Christian sex therapist. She says on her website that she's a certified sex therapist. That's the language that she uses. And she has her name. And when you go to where she got that training, it's a Christian therapy program of some sort that I have no idea what their credentials would be, but I can guarantee you because of the things that come out of her, you know, newsletters and her websites that it's not very LGBTQ affirming. It's, uh, there's still a lot of bias in her sexuality. So this is why if there's any theme to today, (laughs) it's this overarching umbrella of the concerns I have about training and how confusing this must be to the public. Mm -hmm. So any thoughts on that? Oh, well, yes. But what thoughts? The I just pulled up. She's part of a. We're part of a shared Facebook group called "Improving Intimacy in Mormon Marriages," and um, there was an initial post. Do you remember this post, Shannon? Are you part of it? I think so. Okay, yeah. it's, it's the admin posted. Okay, so maybe you saw this where the admin posted something on self. In quotes, he put "self learning versus masturbation." How many talks about in her book, and they were not ashamed, how she talks about self-learning. And he's like, okay, so look, she, she's talking about masturbation, and she was one of the first to talk about this and how this can be really empowering if you know your body and to learn your body. Um, and, and it was a really positive post and nod to Laura's effort to discuss this. Um, and people are talking and defending of like, no, she does not mean masturbation. Yes, she does this whole thing. And then Laura hopped on there and really made clear that it, she is not discussing masturbation and that self-learning is very different. Um, and talks about, she says, I don't see any positive value in promoting masturbation, which is not self-learning. Um, oh my goodness. I can't, I that, don't, and while I, at, what? I don't even know I mean, like what to say to these things. I mean, it feels, is it just like, I mean, is it like facts are not facts or like what are, what kind of error are we in about truth isn't truth and facts aren't facts and are we just in a twilight zone? But belief trumps truth. It, it's it because it, it talks about um because this i think speaks to this a little bit and while i too am opposed to shame as a good motivator members of the church are likely to factor in god's commandments with things that are mortal or natural man so it's again that's the natural man that's not fact that's not science that's the thing we have to fight it, it goes on and on and she talks about her new book new books of knowing her intimately capital h e r and knowing him capital h i m sexually which continues what that to further promote, again yeah yeah Go ahead. he's sexual <laughs> and she's yeah. emotional yeah and very much this gendered approach to sexuality i'm just i'm just apologizing which is kind of taking people. research i think on a different like twisting research because I know and I can't remember what couples therapist says that they've done research and the way most men feel emotionally connected to their wives is through sex. And for most women, they um, want or need an emotional connection in order to have desire. But that does not mean that it can't be the other way around. And no. it doesn't mean that women don't like sex or that you don't need to know your wife sexually. And it also ignores the and, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. It just no, it, it, it ignores <laughs> the huge narrative scripts that we've all grown up with, that that's kind of how we've been taught to emotionally connect to begin with. Yeah. And that, we're trying to undo that exact thing in our offices all the time to help women embrace pleasure 
embrace their sexuality and to be able to see themselves as a sexual being. Because not, I mean, I think a lot of men would love to be known as known emotional. Him, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. I agree. Like, I agree. You know, and it just like, boxes people. It's, yeah, it's. But to, to your point with the letters again, when you don't have title protection, where what is it, Natasha and Shannon? In Florida, it's the only state that right now has title protection that unless like you have to have a license like other to mental health say, credentials to yeah. say you're a sex therapist yeah. but in any other state across the country you can just declare that you're a sex a sex you do sex therapy you can be a sex like go to psychology today and i think there's over 250 self-declared sex therapists in the state of utah and i think Right now, I, have, I haven't gone to the ASEC website in a while, but there's no more than 15 ASEC certified sex therapists. But when yeah, you in don't Utah, have, there's only like seven or eight of us. Yeah. So when you don't have a state or a country or states or licensing bodies that recognizes that this needs to have title protection and that for consumers, it can be really harmful to have people that can just declare, I'm sex positive, I can do these things without any training is really problematic. And do you remember Kristen, that reporter's the one that told us that he like searched through, he said, I yeah. had to search nine pages of psychology today, people to find you and Kristen that everyone was saying that they do sex therapy. Yep. And so I'm sure that's extremely confusing to just, you know, uh, the public out there trying to find a good therapist to see. Yeah. And also until ASEC steps up and advocate, like this should be a part of their advocacy to work more toward title protection. If, if all these people are going to go through the training and get, it's actually so much more than the certification. You can get a certification in a weekend. This is, this is almost like an additional master's degree. And until they're advocating and, seeking out and trying to pursue legislation and doing different things. No, it's I'm, really difficult. I'm fine with calling ASEC out on that. I, I think that that's been a critique we've all been raising because it's kind of ridiculous. And again, how is the public supposed to know who's who and who's what? And, you know, there's all these, like, I mean, we've been talking about certified sex addiction therapy school versus, you know, what we've done for years because, how is the public supposed to know? I mean, all of those credentials sound very authoritative. Yep. And then we all have different opinions. And I just, I'm constantly feeling like I have to, you know, like defend my, my training. Like, no, really, I'm the real cardiologist. I'm not the, you know, pediatrician who's trying to be the cardiologist, you know, like I actually went to cardiology right. school, right? But, but right. is treating me like the pediatrician who's saying, oh, but I, you know, I listen to baby hearts every now and then, right? And so I'm like, wait, what? So I, yeah. that's how I feel all the time. And not, I don't, you know, I, I don't like calling out specific names, but since we're on the subject of how I've just been so shocked by some of the comments from therapists around so many different issues, like, Laura publicly on my Facebook page one time because I was posting things that were research based and that had, I think it had to do with a transgender issue, especially around the time that all the issues were going on around the bathrooms um, and allowing transgender people to go to the bathroom that they identify with. She made some comment on my professional Facebook page about how she was concerned about my salvation. Mm. And I, and I say that because it's there. I mean, she did it. I don't, this is no secret. She did that publicly on my Facebook page. Anybody can see it. It was a public post. And how are we supposed to keep things professional when we are conflating our professional knowledge with our religious beliefs. And so it just, yep. 
it, it just is flabbergasting to me. And, you know, it's interesting because I've been asked now by three different programs to come talk about how to check your religious bias um, mm-hmm. in their MFT program. So I'm actually really glad that I guess I'm getting known to be able to do that. Yeah, that's awesome. And, you know, to be a guest speaker in an MFT class, even though I think it should be a whole course. <laughs> um, yeah. I, 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 and I've just really been developing how to talk to people going into the field that if your religion is and your beliefs are going to get in the way of this profession, then it's okay to say this profession isn't for you. It's okay to do that. And having gone through so much bias myself that I had to check, I almost wish somebody would have like really sat me down and talked about, Hey, these are the issues that you're going to come across in this line of work. And I I don't know that that I was prepared. I I think that's one of the unique things about our collective training and the ASECT training in general is you can get all the knowledge. You can get all the, take all the classes, get all the information. At the end of the day, wrong information can be very problematic. Mm -hmm. What can be, but what is going to harm the client at the end of the day is an unchecked bias, judgment, or assumption that can come in to the therapy office and unless people are going through something that's called a SAR, a sexual attitude reassessment, where you are exposed to different things that can challenge your judgments, assumptions, biases, emotional reactions, and responses so that you can know the populations that you can work with and the populations you can't, where you need to refer out so that they can get good, judgment-free, affirming, supportive care. That is what is really unique about the training. It's not just the information, and it's that we all had to go through something where we had to confront our own stuff so that that doesn't come in, and that if we really butt up against something, we can say, for my ethics and to follow my ethics in which I abide by as a licensed professional, I need to refer this, this person out or these types of issues out. And... And I think that's a unique and highly important piece of the ASEC training. Yeah, that's kind of what we talked about. I agree. All right. Last topic, because I know we're getting late. So the Mormon Mental Health Association, which we are actually all a part of, came out with a position statement this week in regards to uh, worthiness interviews and asking about sexuality in particular to minors. So any thoughts or ideas about this? And I want to kind of take a back seat because I was, I guess, a main drafter of the document that went through. But just so everybody knows, too, that these were things that were probably about 40 different professionals weighed in on uh, out of probably about 100 members. And also it goes through a board of directors vote, which I think there's about 10 of us on the board of directors. So this is definitely not my document. <laughs> this, is, this is something that I worked really hard to make happen, but it's with the voices of many, many really wonderful, very well credentialed people that mm-hmm. uh, have been, you know, very concerned about these matters for a long time. Okay. I'm just pulling it up right this second. Yeah. Um, I've got it up. Do you want to talk about any of it, Natasha, just to review? Well, so yeah. Can... Anything that you would say, you know, stands out to you, Shannon, just even just from the fact. Yeah. That so I think one thing that stands out is the concerns and that you put underneath it. We offer these concerns from a developmental, psychological and trauma informed perspective. So uh-huh. again, you have many individuals who are highly trained and uh, have a lot of education that are able to weigh in on something um, that, you know, they do understand and do know about. They have the ability to do that. And I think that's an important piece that stands out to me, where we've been talking so much about, like, people speaking on things that don't have the education to be doing so. Um, And then the the first one you put... Uh, we believe child and adolescent development and health psychology research support that asking questions of sexual nature 
within the context of religious spiritual worth is an inappropriate and harmful practice for developing minors. Um, yeah, I, I think that uh, you have individuals with uh, absolutely no training in sexual health or sexuality asking questions based on their interpretation um, of kind of how that should be done. And um, I think with everything we've kind of talked about tonight, it continues to promote uh, shame. And I think that that is a huge piece of what I see in my practice is related to sexuality and sexual shame that I'm trying to undo. And I think this is just something that uh, really, really does not need to be done. But I also think if it is any of it's going to be done, um, an adult should be present. A parent should be present. Mm -hmm. And I think you speak to something, uh, the statement speaks to these one-on-one -on -one settings. Um, an adult with a minor, the power difference of the, the highest position of authority within a ward or a branch with a minor and the, the capacity or the ability to navigate that. There's, there's nowhere any organization that's battling this, everyone can agree that that shouldn't be happening where an adult is discussing or questioning or having any conversations about sexuality with a minor. And it is odd that that is happening and that's even questionable and that it's even seeming like we're challenging, but people who are challenging it are challenging the church. Like no matter where you fall on the spectrum, you, everyone should be challenging this because it's not good for children. Mm -mm. Um, but it's, it's problematic because of the vulnerability and the grooming and there's no checks and balances because you have there, there's strict, not strict, that the church then responded and said, well, we're, cha we're changing some of these interview things. But then what? Who, who reports to who? And it's all a similar chain of command. And all these people are untrained all the way up the chain. So I think that the way that this, um, this statement hits everything and I think the container in which of talking about it from the developmental psychological trauma informed perspective nails it because this isn't how we feel. We don't think that this just seems good to do. There's actual evidence, research, and, and proven evidence that this is not healthy or okay on any level. Mm-mm. Yeah, and I think what some people fail to realize, too, is that there is a difference between, you know, a kid having like a um, ministering type of relationship with a clergy person who happens to be in their trusted circle, you know, like, I know here in Wichita, Kansas, we have lots of youth ministers, and I, I can imagine, you know, maybe a kid coming to their minister and saying, hey, I have a situation I want to talk to you about, and I just wanted your opinion, and, you know, maybe I'm thinking of having sex with my boyfriend, or maybe, you know, I'm not sure that what's happening at home is safe, you know, a myriad of things, right? The kids could come to somebody they tr a trusted adult with. But that is a very different relationship and setup in a church environment than what we have, which is actually the, the bishop calls in the kids, right? And says, hey, we're going to ask you these questions, not in the context of, Hey, you know, seeing how you are in your life and seeing if I can be helpful. Although I'm sure many bishops want to be in that space, right? Of being a helper or mentor to the people in their ward. But with this, really the goal of a worthiness interview is, are you worthy? Are you, so it's not, can I help you? You know, can I help you have a better life or sexual experiences or help understand what's going on in your life? It's, now, are you worthy to participate in the types of things that we do here in this setting? Like, you know, going to the temple trip or passing the sacrament or 
having a calling, right? Or getting the priesthood or, so it's a very different context. And then the the other thing I want to say too, is that many, many children and minors conflate all kinds of issues with sexuality. I mean, we're not even good at this as adults, right? So if there has been any type of sexual abuse and you ask a child or a minor, have you, you know, are you following the law of chastity, which is the most benign question out of all the questions that can be asked. That's the most benign question that can be asked. You know, are you living by the law of chastity? Are you following the law of chastity? However you'd put that question. And many, many times, if there's been a history of sexual abuse, the child will interpret that question to remind them, oh, I think I need to say no to that. Or I think there's something wrong with what my storyline is. Because developmentally, many kids are, are blaming themselves yes. for sexual abuse. Okay. And they don't have the skills and the maturity and the understanding, especially if they've gone through something like that, where they can separate those two things. And so right away, we have a lot of kids, when you think about the statistics of sexual abuse, who even with the best bishop, with the most benign question we have, being harmed. Not to mention the 500,000 other things that happen that go way beyond that, right? Because most of us, I think, would not say that that's the only question we were asked. Many of us were asked specifically about masturbation, about pornography, about boyfriends and girlfriends, about certain types of touching, petting, orgasm, all kinds of things. Yeah, not to mention the really even deeper conversations that many ecclesiastical leaders go into. So I just want to really point out that I think, I think that because, you know, when you're the fish and the water, it's hard to know what water is like, right? (laughs) So I think it's very Mm -hmm. hard to understand from especially a believing active, you know, wanting to see this as a wonderful part of your child being reared in the church as harmful when we love our bishops, when we love our leaders, when the kids are really getting a lot of benefits from the youth programs, we have great youth programs, you know, it's hard to then say, wait a minute, here's something that actually could be harming my kid or other kids in our ward. And, and I think it's really important that people start being willing to at least acknowledge that that's a possibility. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think you differentiate really well between it, it's one thing because I've, I know there's a lot of good bishops. I, I love the bishop in my ward and I've had, um, in-laws and, and they're wonderful and their hearts are in the right place. And I think every kid deserves a village of adults that, that love them and are invested in them and want the best for them. But that's very different than a person in authority calling you in for worthiness and, and mingling those two things because mingling the sexuality with the spirituality and it, is, it can be so damaging. And so I think it, it, again, moving out of this black and white and putting some more nuance of ministering and and having a relationship can still exist. It's it's changing this this practice that is harmful. I agree, and I think just taking which I probably can't even do well because of all my experience in the ER and just years and years of experience being a therapist and in the mental health field, but. As just a concerned parent, um, the thought of leaving my child with a man um, in that kind of a power dynamic, you have no idea. You really don't. I mean, as, as lovable as a lot of them are, you're setting up, I think, a situation that could potentially um, where you talk about a little bit where there could be a predator. You just don't know. Um, The rate of sexual abuse is extremely high in this country. And um, the Catholic church has been through it. 
Um, the Mormon church has been through it. We are not, um, oh, I can't find the right word now, but, um, we're not, um, immune. Yes. Thank you. We're not immune to this. That's perfect. That's exactly the word I was looking for. Um, we're not immune to this. And I, so I think just that alone is also frightening. And I think it also goes back to exactly what we were talking about before, um, that you also have kids who have never even been talked to really about sex. And now you've got someone sitting across from them asking them very intrusive questions. And we're not even educating these kids well about sex. And now you've got somebody sitting across from them um, talking to them about, you know, extremely uh, yeah, intrusive questions, intimate details about their body and experiences and uh, what we know as sex therapists, some to just be normal, healthy sexual development. Yeah, it's a huge um, boundaries issue as far as yes. kids to be able to say that's none of your business or I don't need to talk to anybody about that. I mean, that would be the healthier route, right, is to teach kids how to really have privacy and autonomy and understand that they don't have to share private details with an authority figure. So that's a whole nother concern. Mm-hmm. All right, I promise this is the last thing I'll bring up. I just, there's so many things, but can we spend five minutes just discussing the, the fact that it came to my awareness in the last few weeks that the new seminary curriculum mm-hmm. includes now in their examples of modern day revelation, the policy that is so extremely harmful to homosexual members in our church. Yeah. Um, with the concept, and I just want to set this up, with the idea that kids learning about this in a seminary room setting are in the middle of their own sexual development, are in a very crucial time period of feeling either uh, like they fit in or they don't fit in, which teens really, really struggle with. And in the context of so much discussion around suicidal risk given Utah's high rates that have really gone up really pretty significantly. I don't know how you explain that correlation other than the policy. Since the policy came out, the rates have increased significantly. And supposedly, you know, we're so concerned about suicidal coalitions and President, is it Resmond, who is on the suicide coalition, but yet this is what we're putting into our seminary manuals for our teenagers. Yeah. Am I inviting yeah, no. thoughts or am I just like going off on it on like my own soapbox? <laughs> like, oh. No, no. Once it was like, once it was introduced to now we're, we're just going to really hit at home. And I don't know how these kids, I, I, in my practice, I work with, so uh, the main area of focus are people that identify as both um, Mormon or what, a Latter-day Saint, and on the LGBTQIA identification and watching, trying to navigate that and feeling like they have to split off a significant part of their life and who they are and their identity and then or their family and their culture and their belief system and their spirituality i'm i'm working with adults that didn't grow up with this policy and they already internalized so much and so much messaging and now to introduce this to our youth, I don't, I don't know how, to me that takes away for their seminary being a potential safe haven and another place to discuss just the gospel and is hitting home something that I think is very dangerous and potentially harmful and wrong. Like, it's almost hard for me to articulate and talk about this right now because I'm still really, really emotional about it. I haven't been able to metabol- like digest it to where I can 
not get highly emotional. Yeah, I, I agree, Kristen. It is highly emotional. I, I think it's reckless. I think it's dangerous. I just cannot even begin to comprehend what is being thought here, how this is at all in line with any of the mission statements or goals or, or things that the church has come out with saying that they want to love homosexual members and make it a safe place for the church. And, and then yet, you know, continually coming up with really insidious and horrific ways to reject and discipline and ostracize members are homosexual members and not understanding that the highest level of risk here is our youth because again they don't have the maturity the ability to have i mean we know that that you know teenagers are impulsive we know that if they are already you know going through a lot of hormonal changes and shifts and so their moods are harder to control if you've got a gay kid, which I can guarantee you probably almost every ward has one to three gay kids in their wards or in their stakes attending these classes. These are not kids that, first of all, oftentimes have told anybody that they're feeling this way or having issues. So you can have, as a seminary teacher, you can have these kids right there in your class not even knowing it, pretending that these are other people that somehow we're just talking about that are out there and not right in your classroom. And these are kids that don't have a lot of know-how of who to go to and talk to because we're not making it safe to talk about this. And so their risks like go up exponentially because now they're feeling isolated. They're feeling broken. They're feeling like there's something wrong with them. They're feeling like they're sinful. They're feeling like they're dirty. We're also telling them this is what God believes. Oh. This is how, like, that's the other thing is this is, we are messaging saying this is revelation. This is how God currently feels about you. And that is not true. And that is not right. And uh, there was another, there was a friend that posted how in, in response to this whole idea that the idea that we're introducing, and I, I'm going to paraphrase, I'm not going to paraphrase it well at all, but we're basically introducing to these kids, not first how to, like, okay, so there's this policy, we need to bolster up and double down on our efforts to love and include and go to these great lengths. The first introduction to now this issue in seminary is, nope, this is what God thinks, and this is the policy, and this is revelation. That's the first introduction. Not all the other pieces of, uh, we, I, yeah, but, but it, to me, telling these kids that this is from God is, there's a large assumption that all, like, for me, the first place I have to go to is my kids, any one of my kids could, could identify, and I want it to be a sharing more, not a, a big, coming out and I assume with all of these kids that I'm interacting with that I could be interacting with a gay child I can't assume they're not and right now the way we talk about it is that it's not happening under anybody's roof like I don't I don't get it as if these are children that are removed from all of our homes and our friends homes and our neighbors homes and statistically I would even put it higher Natasha like when I look at the primary kids and there's 30 in there. I'm like, there could be four of you right now that, that are, are feeling different and feeling a different attraction than what they're hearing about and learning about. And um, their identity or, uh, yes. Identity, you know, like a bisexuality yes. or just, it doesn't a, a queer, you and know, don't, don't mess with God. <laughs> telling them that because uh, no again I'm I'm it's probably a little raw still because that policy still is raw for me it's never settled into a comfortable comfortable place and so now taking it to another level 
and formalizing it and integrating it and systematizing it further, I just can't. I'm, I'm not a I'm not a great person to articulate a non-emotional response right now. I, I think we need emotional responses and I think we need them from professionals like ourselves. I, I think that yeah. we really are all ethically bound as professionals mm -hmm. to say, this is harmful. This is going to put people at risk. And Shannon, I know Kristen and I are just blabbing away. So please feel free. To <laughs> no, you're fine. Um, Sorry, Shan. No, you're totally fine. Um, I think, it, yeah, I think it's heartbreaking. Um, it's something that's very close to my heart. And uh, I think it's extremely hard as having family members who are gay. Um, extremely difficult for them in a very accepting, loving environment to come out and navigate that without all of this to deal with on top of it. Um, so they, they feel completely alone. And they desperately want to be able to, for a lot of them, belong and belong to something that's been a part of their entire lives and um, feel loved and accepted. And uh, when we have these, uh, you know, revelation, which I have quotes up right now, um, or just policies that are coming out I think it's extremely harmful well when the a church, huge risk yeah when the church comes out and says things like we work tirelessly to prevent abuse and protect children this is not that this mm -mm. is the opposite of that and I don't I, I'm just I'm just appalled I'm just shocked I'm just so shocked that we can be getting this so wrong and that the priorities are so off and that the trauma informed care is so missing. Like I just can't even believe that we are creating spaces in our own church, the church that I love and that I grew up in where it's actually now dangerous to take your children. Yeah. I, I can't, I, I don't even, it, it, like I said, it, it feels like the twilight zone to me. And then not to mention too, that, I don't know why I just keep learning things about Mormonism all the time. I think I know most everything, but then I realize I don't, is that I did not realize that we are asking our 19-year-olds, our 20-year-olds to go out and preach the gospel and share, you know, Jesus Christ's loving messages. And in that process, in, in expecting them to ask people who are wanting to get baptized these incredibly inappropriate questions, such as, one, are you gay? Two, have you had an abortion? Three, are you, you know, having sex with your live-in partner? I, for some reason, this eluded me. I, I guess I just always thought maybe bishops were asking those questions or something, but because not only did this come out in the seminary manual, this now also came out in the missionary training manual that if you have information or are guessing that you have information, it was something along the language of, if you think that this could be the case, ask the question to make sure to see if people are worthy or not worthy to get baptized. I'm just, wow. I, I just can't even comprehend that our 19 year old kids are out there asking grown adults these types of questions, which goes back to the whole boundary issue. Like we have no common sense in Mormonism about what appropriate boundaries are. No, no. And, and I can and tell you the response going... I would have if some Jehovah's witness person, which they're the ones that come around all the time to my house. And I try to be very polite and give them water just like I would my missionaries. But I can tell you what I would do if they were asking me those kinds of questions. Right. Like, yeah. Get out of my house. That would be the appropriate response. Right. So, well, and going back just a tiny bit, it's Caitlin Ryan, who's of the family acceptance project. That's mm -hmm. her research. Correct. It's Caitlin Ryan. Yes. Yes. When we know that acceptance is one of the biggest protective factors for an LGBT youth, when we have now like 
cultural rejection, like it's not just within the family, but it could be within the family and then it could be within the culture and then it could be within, like it's la it's layers of rejection. Uh, yeah. And well, yeah, even for an adult it is. Yes. As a child, it's like, where do you go? That's yeah. why we have such a go? high rate of homeless youth here in Utah per capita but but where do you go like it's not like an adult and i think adults struggle with this just as, you know the, just as much and i'm so glad you brought up caitlin ryan because this just this is why i can no longer like to me this is just i'm just gonna say it because like you said we're just being emotional but i think that emotions play an important role here i think that this is evil because Caitlin Ryan, who is not LDS, by the way, did incredible work for decades, came up with an LDS-friendly pamphlet, which is lovely, beautiful, beautifully done, respecting all of our values and all of the things that members of the church would want, and has offered these resources now to the leadership of our church for at least a decade. So mm -hmm. there's a lot that our leaders do not know. They know. They've had the resources offered to them. They've had people like you and me and Kate and Ryan, both within and outside of the church, sharing resources, sharing concerns, sharing research for at least a decade. And this mm -hmm. is what happens now, this month. Yep. I cannot give it a pass. It is not an innocent not understanding. It is a going forward in spite of. Yep. Yep. All right. I All right. don't know what to say to the two of you other than you got totally probably bamboozled by me bringing up 500 things. I didn't I know. <laughs> <laughs> why not just cover it all it was great <laughs> uh, we, we missed a month it's okay that's true we did <laughs> we missed last month sorry I've quieted at the end I'm like fading I was out oh, for probably like six times between the two kids back and forth <laughs> between the room it was ridiculous I yeah. almost told you I can't do this <laughs> but I was like no yeah, I'm just gonna do it I'm always so happy when you I'm glad you were on. Yes. You always have such good things to say. Well, thank yeah. you. Both. I know I've kept you over time. Please don't let me scare you. Please come back to Mormon Sex Book Club. <laughs> I will, of course. <laughs> and to those who are listening, please weigh in with comments. Please be willing to offer a donation if you find these resources valuable. Please have these conversations with people that matter in your life and in your congregations. Please help us protect LGBTQ plus kids. Please be aware that there are those kids in your congregations right now. So with all of that, I will send you all off with hopefully happy, wonderful, sexual, sensual energy, which we didn't bring much to the show on, but you know, <laughs> believe it. <laughs> Lots of pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you Kristen and Shannon for your time tonight I mm -hmm. appreciate it thanks for You're having welcome. me thanks for having us on all right good night good night, good night. Bye -bye. <laughs>
that through every storm we travel on like lovers do. And if sometimes we fell apart, we always came back home. Was as simple as I love. Ordinary. No, it's extraordinary. 